Well, since everybody here is over 30, I think, not quite, I'll give you a little background. First, I'll give you a, a riddle. According to my mother, I was the second most talented genius in chess. Why is that? I learned chess in the year 1948. Bobby Fischer learned chess in the following year, 1949. It took him seven years of study to reach my level. What is my mother's fallacy? Does anybody have the answer? She was wrong. It seemed to go off. You can think about it, and if you come up with the answer at any time, just uh, come out with it. By the way, uh, you can interrupt me for comments or questions at any point in this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have a better move, I'll be, I'll be glad to hear about it. Okay, let me just say that I played a lot of Blitz with Bobby Fischer when he was a little kid. But the first time we played in an actual tournament <coughs> was in 1957 in East Orange, New Jersey. If you've heard of Forey Laux, he ran a, a chess club out there in Orange, in New Jersey. And in this, our first actual tournament game, Bobby had just turned 14, and it was a 50-50 tournament, 50 moves in 50 minutes, and I guess after that it was 20 and 20, whatever. So it was a rapid tournament. This was not the most flawlessly played game you'll ever see, but I think it's entertaining. And I'll try to go fast, and if anything is too fast, then speak out. He was white, e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, c takes d, knight takes d4, knight to f6, knight to c3, d6, and now his favorite move, bishop to c4. He made a career of that move. He used to attack on the king side. He would force, he would play f5 and force the e pawn to come to e5. And then this bishop would have a ferocious diagonal. And the square here would be a hole on d5. So I didn't want to put him to all that trouble. I just thought I'd save him the effort. And I played e5 right away. <laughs> Not necessarily a good move, but who knew opening theory in those days? Knight to f5, and now I came up with the brilliant idea of losing a tempo. Bishop to e6, bishop to b3, and now I took the knight. Bishop takes f5, pawn takes f5. Now he has his favorite kind of position with this big hole, this wonderful diagonal, and we'll see if he can take advantage of it. Bishop b7, bishop g5, Black castles, white castles, knight to d4, attacking the advanced pawn and also getting ready to elim eliminate the big bishop. Queen to d3, and 
and I attacked the pawn again. He defended indirectly this way. I can't take it. Knight takes bishop. A pawn takes. If I said rook pawn, would you all know what a rook pawn was? You're not all al algebraic, right? Okay. Took this off. Sorry, I missed a couple of moves before. He had exchanged the bishop for the knight already. And he was eyeing this square for his knight. Tremendous square. Pawn takes pawn. Rook takes pawn. Bishop b5. Rook f3. Now take stock. When this knight comes in here, it'll be a, a monster, a powerhouse. So probably I should take it off and have an inferior game, have a backward d pawn, let him attack it, hope for a draw. That's the practical way. But he was just a kid. You know, I wanted to win the game. So I thought I would attack him. <clears throat> Queen to d8. Knight to d5. Now he's leaving this pawn on priest. But if black takes it, there's probably hell to pay. This rook may come up here. Pawn may come here. It's just my king position is really shaky. So I went for another pawn. Queen here. Now most players would protect this pawn. It seems threatening, right? <laughs> but uh, he had better ideas. He had better ideas. He gave me that pawn. Attacking the queen. Rook to a4. Queen takes h2 check, king to f2, and now I I have that extra pawn, but it's very hard to digest, and that queen is not happy. The queen can be lost in the next move with rook to h3, right? So the queen has to get out of there. Queen retreats to h5. comes up with a nine move combination. <laughs> Check. King to h8. Attacks queen. Has only one square to go to. Queen to g5. Now look at this next move. Rook takes pawn, check. I was cool, you know, I'm just playing a kid, all right? This doesn't scare me. Anyway, I only have one move, so I have to take the rook. Now he plays discovered check. Queen checks the king. Gotta go here. Now queen checks. There's only one good move, which is queen here. And now this rook comes over here. Winning my queen. Notice only by taking his bishop did I allow this rook out here to try to checkmate me. All right, I didn't foresee that far. All right, so it's a 50-50 game. It's when I get 
around move 20, I, I'm in time pressure in almost every game. This was move uh, 26. So from now on, it's mostly just automatic moves, all right? Bishop takes pawn to prevent mate. Rook takes queen. I mean, rook, rook takes queen check, yes. Pawn takes rook. Queen takes pawn check. King to g7. Knight to f5 check. King to g8. And now white has a win in one move. What's the move? Can you point out the move? Correct. Queen to h6. Why is that? Because the bishop... <coughs> Correct. How old were you when you learned chess? Uh, six, nine. Okay, I'll, I'll find out your name later. <laughs> I have spies. So, Fisher could have capped an excellent sacrificial attack with a forced win. Instead, he played the dumbest move of his career. He played this. Pawn to c3. What does this have to do with the game? I don't understand it. Even today I don't understand it. He obviously didn't see the forced win. And he's, pro he's protecting this pawn as if I cared about this pawn. Okay, now, I knew what was happening. I heaved a sigh of relief and immediately prevented the mate. Rook a to e8. Knight takes pawn. I'm like reborn here, Lazarus. <laughs> Rook to e5. The rest is just automatic. It's like a sparring match in a, in a boxing camp, you know. Just it's move on move. I guess he was in serious time pressure as well. Queen to g4 check, rook to g5. Queen to f4, rook to g6. And now I'm well defended. Nobody's going to make me now, right? Knight to e4, bishop to g7. When company is expected, I'm well protected. He plays g3. I don't have an explanation for that move either. I don't understand it. Actually, it creates a target as far as I can see. But then when you're 14, what do you expect, right? Okay. Rook e8, king to g2, bishop e5, black is on the attack, right? <coughs> Queen f5, b6, <coughs> I think it makes my pawns more defensible. <laughs> B4. Actually, neither side can do anything real. We're just making motions here. B4. Not bishop to G7. Queen to F3. Rook G6. Looks as if black is dictating the action now, huh? No? Yeah. Yes? Okay. 
knight to g5, rook to f6, queen to h5, threatening a check. Who's afraid of one check? I pinned the knight, rook e5, queen checks, king f8, and now he, he makes a real blunder. Knight e4, and I blunder right back. I could win his queen in one move. What's the move? Correct. This would have ended the game. It would have been a really dumb game, starting with a, an excellent combination and fizzling out. Anyway, I didn't play it. We played a few more moves and agreed to a draw. He probably saw that he would get a queen for two rooks. By the way, he preferred queens to rooks. I like a show of hands. Who would rather have two rooks? Who would rather have a queen? All right. Well, what do the books say? Two rooks. Two rooks. Two rooks. Yeah, that's right. But Fisher preferred the queen, and he proved it time and again. But I will I'll give you a caveat. <coughs> what about three minor pieces in the queen? Who likes the three minor pieces? Who likes the queen? I didn't say which minor pieces. If it's two bishops and a knight, I lean to that. Yeah. A bishop and two knights, no. Um, but here's a tip. The stronger you are, the better you'll handle the two rooks of the three pieces. The weaker you are, the better you'll handle the queen. That summer, namely two, three months after this game, I won that tournament, by the way. Um, Fisher won the U.S. Open in a tie with Arthur Biscayer. He won on tie break in Cleveland, Ohio. I was there. I had my usual result around tied for fifth or something like that. And I realized this kid was off and running. I'd never be able to equal him again. I did play him that September, also in New Jersey, in the New Jersey Open, and it was the same Landhard Sozin attack, Sicilian defense, <coughs> and I played lousy and, and he won. I won't show you that. <laughs> the next time we played was in the U.S. Championship of 1959-60. At that time, they would always have the U.S. Championship in New York City in a depressing hotel in the middle of winter, and it would always be from Christmas over New Year's. So you had to really love chess. I played in it several times, and so I got to play Fisher several times more. The first time I played him, he had already been U.S. champion for two years. He had he'd won two in a row, and this was his third U.S. Championship, and he wanted to, uh, of course, continue the streak. And I was going nowhere in particular. I was in medical school. I never thought I could be a professional chess player.
but I was happy to play in the U.S. Championship. And uh, I'm going to go through this game a little bit faster. It was a Nimzo Indian defense. I was white. I played my favorite Rubenstein variation, E3. Who plays D4 here? Who's a D4 player? All E4 players? No. Just, okay. Okay, when you face the Nimzo Indian, do you like to play the Rubenstein move? Or do you like to play the Capablanca move? Okay. Well, I don't think much of this. That's my personal bias. I think it's a non-developing move. It's more getting ready to develop the bishop. There, there are ways for black immediately to fight for an attack after queen c2. I would refer you to the games of Igor Sokolov uh, against Adams and Kasparov against Adams in the same tournament a few years ago where Adams got ferocious attacks in both. Yes? What about F3 or A3? A3 is totally out of fashion. Bob Finnick was known to play it. I played exactly once or twice in my life. If you study Nimsovich, a great thinker, you might think that a double pawn is the worst thing in the world. And at one time I, I felt that way. And at one time, as black, without being kicked, <coughs> I took the horse here just to double the pawn. That was, that was extremism. Is, is queen uh, b3 played? It's out of fashion. Doesn't seem to achieve a great deal. The last time I saw it played was in the match uh, Sirawan Timon. It didn't make any headway. The F3, you asked, somebody asked about F3? That's an exciting move. Should be analyzed. I played it once or twice. Very aggressive. Yes. It's, it's a very decent move. OK. So I'm white. I'm dictating the course of action, you understand, all right? <laughs> He castled, which is not the sharpest move. The sharpest move is c5. Knight, g2. That may seem odd to some people, blocking the bishop. It's a very simple idea. I want to recapture on this square with the knight. I've had a lot of experience with this move. In fact, I even played it last night and lost. <laughs> D5, E3. Now, everybody and his brother would play bishop to E7. Fisher played bishop to D6. He's asking for it. And I gave it to him. C5. You going to give me a tempo to attack on the queen side? Be my guess. This should be seven, B4. Now, if he hadn't lost the tempo, he would have been able to liquidate all these pawns on the A and B file and have no particular trouble. But he's going to have trouble. B6, knight F4. Take C, B takes C, and black is suffering from lack of space. The usual way black tries to get out of that is somehow get in this move. 
e5. I don't want to let him do that. He played bishop a6 to trade off my so-called good bishop. I don't really believe that many bishops are bad, but anyway, this is my good bishop, and this is my so-called bad bishop. I took it to put his knight offside. Bishop takes a6, knight takes a6. <coughs> and um, immediately attacked no. castles. He sees this knight is doing nothing, so he retreats it to b8, which is indicative that black's position is not so hot. I think you'll agree. Bishop to d2. Mainly that's to unite rooks. Knight comes out to c6. He thinks that's a better square than where he was before. I immediately attack it. Queen to a4. Queen to d7, and now he's in a position soon, I don't know what happened to the mic, um, he's in a position to get an e5 and free his game. So I prevented it. Knight to d3, and he's still stuck in a bind. If I get in knight to b4 and he exchanges, <coughs> I improve my pawn formation. He doesn't want that, so he prevents that. a5. But this is now a weakness. White is happy in this position. coming into e4 at the moment. I play f3. Rook defends queen on d8. Rook f to b1. There's only one open file, and guess who's on it? Me. Do you like the way my game is developing so far? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. Knight to e8. Now, this is kind of a pathetic move, in my opinion. He can't do much. But the point of it is to, again, to play e5 advantageously. And I want to stop that. F4. The knight comes back to F6. Now it's time to penetrate. Rook to B7. Can you feel the vice tightening on Black's position? <laughs> the suspense here. He occupies the only decent square he has for a piece, knight to e4. He wants me to take it and dislodge my knight and give him the square. No way. Bishop to e1. Got to find some counterplay, so he plays g5, trying to open up something on the king side. Knight to e5. I 
be perfectly happy to trade queens. Knight takes knight. F pawn takes knight. Queen takes queen. Knight takes queen. And look at this ending. He has one thing to boast. A good square in the center. He's got a pawn on prees. He's got this pawn under attack by the bishop. And I have the only open file. I don't want to telegraph the ending of the game to you yet. He defends the pawn, rook d c a. He's in a very passive position here. Rook a b1, absolute control of the only open file. Rook a b1, king to f8. Rook one to b5, <coughs> and this pawn looks like a goner. <coughs> King to e8. But this pawn is immune. If the bishop takes, then pawn to c6, and the, the protector of the bishop is dislodged. If rook takes, he trades rooks and brings the other rook to a8, and he wins a piece. But um, I was hip to that. Now I want you to notice the voyage of this knight <coughs> on a4 to a7. Okay. Knight back. Now this pawn is indeed threatened. Going to be two. He plays a four. King f one. Routine move. F six. He feels that he feels he has to do something. F six. Knight to d three. Pawn takes pawn, <coughs> e5, knight takes pawn, bishop f6, knight to c6, <laughs> king d7, knight to a7, mission accomplished. <laughs> Rook to f8, one c6 check. King to e8. Now his rook is on the line with my king, so I get it out of the way. King to e2. Text the pawn, bishop to d8, rook to a5, putting this pawn in jeopardy. So should I grab this pawn right away? I could. I guess I could. Uh, I didn't grab it right away. I had bigger game in mind. I want this pawn. Because then this passed pawn is close to queening. So knight to b5. A game like this is worth spending New Year's in New York City, I'll tell you that. He traded rooks, rook takes a5, bishop takes a5. 
I allowed him to penetrate with his rook because I didn't care. Rook to f2 check, king to e1, rook to b2. I let his rook get very active because I knew that as soon as this pawn falls, I win. So, rook to b2, and uh, now rook to b8, threatening to win a bishop immediately, to win a rook also. By the way, there's a trap here. When he played rook to b2, he's hoping I'd play knight check, pawn takes knight, rook takes rook, bishop takes bishop check. I would lose two pieces for a rook. I was hip to that, so I played rook to b8. What if you play knight takes c7? Same thing. Bishop oh. takes c7. Okay, knight takes c7. Check. Check, bishop takes. Then if rook takes rook, bishop takes bishop check. <coughs> um, bishop takes bishop takes bishop. It's not as accurate as what I did. I drove his king away first before I took the pawn, before I, I planned to take the pawn. Now this was move 38, and you can count on my flag being hovering, the guillotine ready to fall. I'm threatening to win um, everything in short order, so he has to get his king out of here. I took the bishop. I took the knight, he took the knight on b5. This is move 40, my last move before the time control. It's my move, I'm white. I can win by force. All I have to do is calmly retreat the bishop, and next I'm going to win this pawn. The way he can save it. If he retreats here, check, king here, rook back here, this pawn drops, this pawn wins. Simple. I would have been the hero of five old ladies in Manhattan. But instead of move 40, I just grabbed the pawn right away. And he was sure happy to see that move. That's a big blunder. Dr. Sadie, is the knight on e4 still? Uh, yeah. This was a super blunder on my part converting a winning position into a losing position. He now checks. King has only one square rook behind my precious pawn and I cannot protect it. When I lose that pawn, the rest is not very interesting. His knight is better than my bishop and his rook is active, and he, he went on to win in a few more moves. There's no weakness on the A? You mean to, to win this pawn? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, let's say rook here takes pawn. Now this bishop has got to go somewhere. Um, is the king on f7? Yeah. Just a sec. Okay, the king's on f7. Well, let's say the bishop goes here, and, uh, 
the rook can drive the king farther back, and uh, this would be mate. <laughs> And then he could defend that pawn if he wanted to, or he could just start grabbing all my pawns. It's a sad story. <laughs> but that's chess. Chess is a fight. And I never learned how to use my time right. So what are your uh, impressions so far? I should give up? Yeah, all the time. Almost every game. That's an American disease. The Soviets did not have that problem. They trained in the right way. They managed their clocks. No, no, we don't want to say that. We're going to position. Um, first, you have to have a coach that cracks a whip on you. And uh, corrects your bad habits. In this country, I, I never laid eyes on a coach. I never had a teacher. Um, the biggest lesson I had is when I lost to Petrosian in San Antonio. I said, Where did I go wrong? And he said, I'll tell you mañana. That was it. <laughs> But his wife came up to me and said, you overlooked Bishop D3, yes? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, three years after this, uh, there was the famous event where Fisher won 11 out of 11. The only time that's ever happened. In fact, the only time anybody got close. He would usually win by 9 to 2. He won this tournament in 59-60 with 9-2, a point and a half ahead of Lombardi. If I had won the game, it was only right and just, he still would have won the tournament. So, in the 11-game sweep that he engineered in 1963-64, I was the final opponent, and uh, I was doing very well in the tournament. And, and I was tied for second with Evans the day before, and I don't know why I was doing well. Nothing was in my favor in terms of my life at the time, but anyway, I definitely went into the game saying, I'm going to draw this game. I'm not going to have any more of this nonsense. So early in the game, a lot of pieces were exchanged, and we came down to a bishop against a knight. And my bishop was technically somewhat bad, because we had pawns in the center here, and I had the black squared bishop and he had the knight. So technically I had one pawn on the same color as my bishop, and so technically my bishop was a little bad. But as I told you before, the bishop's gotta be real bad for me to not play them. Um, so what happened was we reached this position at adjournment. This is fairly famous. Um, this endgame is in the book by Sheryshevsky on endgames, but he has a position wrong. He has the pawns on a7 and b6, and his whole analysis is nonsense as a result. Now, in those days, who? Has anybody adjourned a game? I mean, do you know what adjourned games are? <laughs> yeah, I've heard. There was 
young people, they don't know what an insurance game is. We play, we play for five hours. You have to make 40 moves in two and a half hours. And if the game isn't finished, you adjourn. That means whoever is on move seals a secret move in an envelope. And when the game is resumed, the envelope is open, the move is made on the board, the game proceeds. So it would be 16 moves per hour in the second session. And in this position, temporarily white is a pawn ahead, a pawn is going to fall. So I was still defending. And I thought here for 45 minutes out of my hour. And I saw how to draw the game. Clearly, I saw how to draw the game. But something in me didn't trust my own judgment. Okay? For some reason, my analysis, I, I didn't trust myself. And at the last moment, with 15 minutes left for 10 moves to seal my move, Instead of the correct move, I sealed the wrong move. And when Fisher came to the game the next day and the envelope was open and he saw the move I had played, he smiled. I won't, I won't show you what I played, I'll show you the draw that I calculated and didn't play. King back here, knight takes pawn, bishop g1. It looks as if the bishop is quite unhappy, right? King here, king here. Now everything depends on a tempo. Right now, white is threatening this move, pawn to g3, takes, takes, and now it's skin and bones. Black can't win this anymore. Okay? So, you'd have to retreat. Um, sorry, I, I achieved this position by putting yet another pawn on a black square <clears throat> against principle. He would have to retreat. Bishop attacks his pawn. Knight defends the pawn. Now, if pawn advances, pawn takes, bishop takes, knight takes, king takes, and king to e4 wins for black. So now it's necessary to lose a tempo, lose another tempo. Put another pawn on black square. He doesn't want to move the knight because he'll lose the pawn. He has to go here. Now it's time to force the exchange. Pawn takes pawn in passing. Bishop takes pawn. Now if he takes the bishop, white has the opposition, black cannot penetrate. Knight takes bishop, king takes king here, king here. Black cannot penetrate, black cannot get in. And I anticipated this position later in, in the game. King here, king here, bishop here, knight here, white to move. He could achieve this. White to move. If white plays bishop here, he loses because the knight attacks two pawns simultaneously and the bishop has to give way has to give up one of the pawns. If the king moves, then the black king penetrates. 
So the, I saw all this at adjournment. I just have to calmly play the, the bishop here, and if he attacks, now I bring the bishop here. Everything's defended. But somehow in my mind I said, gee, I don't want to have a bad bishop. <laughs> I would have rather had a draw, but it didn't happen. understand that I last spoke to him in 1978 or 9 and he broke off relations with me and I was very happy. Um, so it was all a progression from there. Well, he was very, very particular about conditions, lighting, and uh, where the board was set up and everything. He was very hard to please at a, at a, as a teenager. As soon as he was U.S. champion, he wanted to dictate all the terms. And he, <clears throat> I, I went with him to Switzerland as his guardian in, uh, for Zurich. By the way, he was almost six years younger than I. Did anybody figure out the riddle about my mother? You missed the riddle? I learned chess in 1948. Fisher learned chess in 1949. One year later, it took him seven full years to reach my level of play. Why? Nobody has figured this out? Definitely. A six-year-old brain and an 11-year-old brain. Two different things. <laughs> yes. If I, if I know my chess history correctly, Fisher stayed at your residence during the negotiations for the Reykjavik marriage? My family's residence, yeah. In Long Island. Did anybody chronicle Well, there are several books on on the uh, the match and the What's format. The match? the match I was thinking about more the, the decision process where he's staying, like you say, in your parents' residence, you know, and, and hemming and hawing about whether to go or not to go. Well, are you familiar with a book called uh, Bobby Fisher Against the Rest of the World by Brad Dara? There's a lot of fiction in the book. It's written like a pulp novel, but it, it's approximately correct. So that's that would answer your question. But the most professional book I know about the match and the politics is by the two Englishmen, Ida Now and Edmonds. I forget the name right now. Red Queen, Red Queen, White Queen. No, I don't. I, I forget. Um, I don't know, E-I-D-E-N-O-W. It has, it's an impartial discussion of the politics from both sides by Englishmen. I do want to show you one more position because it's very instructive. in another U.S. championship. I was white again in the Nimzu Indian. And I had seen in some magazine that this was a good move and I played it. it seemed okay. He castled. And I struck forward in the center. He grabbed a pawn. 
He liked her. I myself, I don't like to be a pawn hand. I'd rather have the initiative. I don't want to be down material either, but I always prefer the initiative. Okay. Now, in Fisher's private um, notes that are collected in a $500 book that I've read by Alessandra Di Lucia, he says that the audience at this point was buzzing with anticipation and hoping that Sadie would play the right move. Uh, Sadie did not play the right move. Um, somebody suggest a, a good sharp move for white. Well, then he will take the bishop and wouldn't accomplish anything, but it will lose the bishop. Um, this would attack the rook, but the queen would come to the rescue and nothing really would come of it. Nothing much would come of it. H4? But that's a good, good uh, H4. H4. Who said H4? H4. You got it. What I played was bishop to d2, which was pathetic, and he went on to win. But h4, I guess anybody that read the book, The Art of Attack by Vukovic, would know this move. Did you read that book? Yes, and it's also a kind of a fishing pole. <laughs> okay, is it in Vukovic's book? <coughs> the so idea like is that uh, <coughs> he can't kick away my bishop because he could get mated if he tries to take this bishop. He, he has to worry about being mated. Um, he has to hustle now. He's, he has to get out of dodge quickly. And now... Threatening mate. Here. Check. Here. And Fisher, in his own notes, says, pawn here, queen back, queen back, threatening, threatening knight to e4 with a crushing attack, he says in his own notes. So he, he said he was quite relieved that I, I didn't play the move. Um, Now, six months, seven or eight months later, he reached the same position in the Piatigorsky Cup tournament against Portish. Portish was famous for putting in eight-hour days studying chess day in and day out. And Portish obviously had looked at our game, and he was quite willing to risk something similar for white. So Portish got this far and he played e4 Fisher took a different course of action this time. He didn't grab a pawn. No, the bishop is on uh, c1. Okay. Fisher traded in the center. Knight takes, knight takes, queen takes, attacking the rook. So if you play a natural move, queen to, I mean, knight to d7, bishop to d3, threatening mate in one, knight to f6, attacking the queen, queen to h4. Pawn h6. White has, has, White has a very comfortable game with two bishops and one little weakness, but White has the initiative. And I'm sure Portish was just looking forward to that. Fisher was prepared with something else. Queen to d7? Queen to d7. Yes. 
He did not, he did not defend his work. Portish threatened made in one. Down there. On up here. Oh, wait a second. He also interpolated bishop a3, rook e8. Then he threatened made in one. Pawn here, and then he finally took the rook. Knight comes here, and the queen is trapped again. Queen takes rook. Now, um, Fisher has his queen against two rooks again. He's very happy. And he soon won this weak pawn, and he went on to win the game. So, uh, it's an echo. In another game we played, the only game that he played in the entire year of 1968, I was his opponent, and it won a uh, best game award in Informant Magazine for the following half year, because they got it late. Uh, it wasn't a good game, it was totally unsound. I could have improved in many ways. But they were so thrilled that Fisher was back in action that they had to give him a best game award. <laughs> Four years later, Karpov was white playing my side against Bayon. And stupidly enough, they followed the moves for 23 moves, the same moves as Sadie Fisher. And, and many of those moves were very dubious moves. They followed them all and eventually made a draw, which reminded me of Botvinnik's less than elegant comment about Karpov. He was quoted as saying, from the point of view of fertility, Karpov has the fertility of a sterile woman. That's what he said. Well, I, I think Karpov depended so much on a dozen seconds finding opening variations for him. Fisher was in his hotel room finding his own moves with no help. <laughs> well, that's enough, uh, enough chess positions. Yes. Well, if he doesn't take it, he, he's, he's threatened with e5, which will accentuate everything. We'll attack the rook in the corner and increase the pressure on f6. He's got to do something. So Fisher suggested he should drop the bishop back to b7, stopping the e-pawn from moving and giving back the ill-gotten pawn. That's basically it. One day, I was 11 years old, my father said, there's this game that uh, I just learned, uh, I'd like to show you the game, that's, that's it. And uh, it's very critical in a boy's development, if and when he beats his father in anything. And I beat my dad three days later, so I was hooked on chess for life. Yes. Well, I used to play there. I gave an exhibit there once. Uh, <laughs> that was 1962-3, when I was an intern. Those were the years that you were in and out of the... I think so, but I may have, ret may have returned there a few years afterwards. Were you know, any stories of skittles in New York or going in between tournaments with Fisher or playing coffee house with Fisher or just any stories? Not firsthand, only what I've read. 
Yes. Is chess played out? Will it become obsolete because of all the computers and all the variations that haven't been analyzed out? Will, there ch will chess be here in 100 years? Do you enjoy playing in the well, National Open? At my level, I'm an A player, but I mean at the top level. Well, Carlson thinks that uh, he can play like a computer, but he still loses games. <laughs> yes. When you beat your father, what was his reaction? He didn't care. The chess meant nothing to him. Yeah. What were the years of uh, your tournament play at Lone Pine? Who were there several years? Where was there several years? Uh, 72 to 70. I, my last time there was, I had one purpose alone, which is to play Smyslov because I had played several world champions and I wanted to play Smyslov. So I think that was 1974. And I went there and I said to Isaac Kashkan, the director, Isaac, you know me for a long time. You know I'm an honest man. Pair me with Smyslov. <laughs> no, no such luck. <laughs> anyway, Smyslov was a very nice, affable guy. I was playing in London a few years later and he came over and he looked at my end game and I was playing against a bad bishop, and he looked at it, and I looked at him, and he smiled. He, he kind of liked my end game. He was a nice guy. Yes? You said you played the Canadian Championships. Did you ever play against Igor Ivana during those times? No, in Canada, I played him many times. Oh. We had a very exciting, I played him once in Canada, in fact. I had an overwhelming position, and he was drunk. That, that was about par for the course, and he tricked me into a draw. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I played Igor a lot. He was he was an uh, an unfortunate genius, and nobody could get him to quit drinking. I once said to him, Igor. Why don't you join Alcoholics Anonymous? This was after he had passed out of the tournament and ended up in the hospital. And he says, I don't need those losers. <laughs> yes? Are you going to write a book of your best games uh, in the future? Why my best games? Why, why, why those games? All right, y'all. All, all the games, yeah. I have a book in, in the works now. It's called I Could Have Been a Contender. Is there a place you love to play now? I mean, do you go to the Marshall Chess Club or do you live in a different part of the country? I live in LA. So, do you, is, there a, is there a place uh, there to go that you really like? Or? Um, nothing that uh, I can mention, but. Now it's time for a commercial. I wrote this book, 1983, a dialectical novel. There's no chess in it whatsoever. I wrote it in 1973, and it published last year. And if you go to the website, 1983thenovel.com, it's very exciting. I, I do have a couple. And well, if, if that's if, the no chess, you understand? It doesn't matter. It's better without it. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. What type of medicine did you take? Average. <laughs> Public health preventive medicine. It's very, it's impossible to have a profession play serious chess and have a family all at once. Cannot be done. I certainly never succeeded in that. Yes? Fisher, why did he quit after he won a world championship? Why did he go, I mean, and hide away? Do you think I understand crazy people? <laughs> <laughs> I think he, uh, Somewhere deep inside him, he knew that he might lose.
And that was like death to him. He couldn't stand that idea. So he even had a match with Glitterich all set up and announced for a million bucks. That's Fisher's share. Glitterich was willing to play for nothing just to get him to come back into play. And the last minute, Fisher tripled the monetary demand. Oh, jeez. It was all over. Does that mean that when he played Spassky for the second time, that he was certain he was going to win in his own mind, at least he thought he was the best? Consciously, he always thought he was the best. Years before he won the world championship, he felt that the Russians cheated him out of it. So consciously, there was no, no question. But in the unconscious mind, you know you can lose a game. Well, Spassky was a wonderful guy, a good friend, yeah. and uh, wasn't so he, he knew Spassky was way over the hill. Yeah. And he got three million bucks for it. Yeah. You know, Korchnoi said that they did cheat Fisher. They, they read games, they read draws in, in 1963, the Caraco tournament. They, they got in Petrosian's room and they agreed to draw all the games to prevent him from catching them. Uh, Victor Korchnoi said they definitely did cheat him. They, yeah, they prearranged games. Yeah, he said that. They, they I, I, I accept that. Yeah. So it, it's something, it's food for thought that, that chess is not always honest, even though you are very honest. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. In fact, one time I, I said to Gligorich, I said, Gliga, you're the only honest player in Yugoslavia. He said, that's not true. Mr. Parma is also honest. <laughs> yes. But even if they did rig all those draws, it seemed like Korchnoi and Tal would never draw even the Russians. They always seemed to fight to the end. Yeah, they were, they were uh, staunch guys, but Tal was not a dissident like Korchnoi was. Tal would conform if he needed to. And Korchnoi always beat Tal, even when he was champion. Tal beat him one. Yes? Did you ever get depressed after a loss and think about quitting chess? <laughs> depressed, yes. Quitting, no. <laughs> Actually, I felt more depression when, when a tournament was over and the brotherhood would disappear in, in all different directions. It would be like, I'm all alone now. Where are all my brothers? Yes? Opportunity for another shameless plug. Besides 1983 and novel, didn't you just, uh, maybe in the last year or two, release a, a major uh, chess book? Uh, yeah. Um, the March of Chess Ideas was put into an e-book form and uh, the, the way to get that is to go to eplusbooks.com Excuse me, wait. E plus, no, no periods. Eplusschess.com It's sold you know, it's Kindle. It's got some great photos that Jerry, Miss, Jeremy Silman discovered of the great players. Lots of new photos. Well, the old book had no photos. Yes? Did, did you have a rivalry with Rzhevsky or Evans or, 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 or Mendes or any of the... Uh, a rivalry? I mean, did you enjoy playing certain players more than others? Well, it was always a, an honor to play Ryshevsky, one of the all-time greats, and I, I had the pleasure of beating him twice. He beat me four times, we had some draws, but he was over the hill when he, when he was playing me. He was well up in his late 50s, I guess. Larry Evans, uh, he's one, the only grandmaster I could never beat. He and Lombardi, I could never beat. <laughs> By hook or crook. Yes? I would say that um, I'm not sure if I really should ask this question, but do you think that Fisher was treated fairly when he was retained in Tokyo? No, no way. I don't think.
believe the government has the right to tell you where you can and cannot play chess. Because Serbia was getting all kinds of black market arms under the nose of uh, the great powers, and suddenly a, a guy goes there to play chess and they're going to come down on him like a ton of bricks? Ridiculous. No way. He was ordered not to play. It wasn't a tax issue, really. He says, you're not allowed to do business in Serbia. My understanding was he never paid taxes on the winnings. That... Well, I mean, this was before the match. He didn't have the money, so it wasn't a question of payment. They ordered him not to play. Like he's a pawn of U.S. foreign policy. No, no, I wasn't. I want to make sure that was not correct. Yeah. Does it say that? There's some inaccuracy. I'm going to have to come down hard on Sam Sloan. I think he wrote that in there. <laughs> well, I think uh, we've exhausted everything. Yes? One more. Um, before the World Championship, you had a relationship with Fisher. But afterwards, did it split or? Uh, Fisher and I were close until he was 16, and then we got back together when he was 27. And that lasted until he was 35, and then we had no more contact. Last quick question. I heard it said that after uh, he won in Reykjavik, wasn't invited to the White House like he would have expected to be uh, a non-intellectual country, and he felt he beat an intellectual country single-handedly. That uh, he became extremely angry at the United States over not getting the White House. Any truth to that? Well, actually, I think that the visit to the White House was dangled in front of him by Henry Kissinger <laughs> in advance, so that was a betrayal. I think that was the case. They, they, Nixon decided we have enough crazy people in the White House. We don't need him. I understand, I understand Nixon's uh, feeling was that Bobby's mother was a communist, and therefore Nixon, being paranoid himself, was incapable of realizing that Bobby and his mother were two different people. I never heard that argument, but that. Nixon did warmly welcome a well-known pinko actor named De Souza, that performed the play 1776, and they sang an anti-war song, and Nixon was gracious enough then. <laughs> but Bobby never got uh, to the White House after he beat the whole Soviet chess machine single-handedly, right? No. Yeah, that tells me that all right. Yes? After Bobby Fischer forfeited game two, um, you requested to have the third game in the back room, and Spassky could have said no. Do you feel that uh, a lot of other Russians would have said no and just taken the World Championship and walked away? Spassky was told to come home. You have won the match. The Soviet Union has been disrespected by this upstart from Brooklyn. Come home. You remain the world champion. And Spassky said, no, I want to play. He was a great sportsman. Okay, folks, thanks very much.